Welcome to the AP Physics Lecture on Kinematics. Here I will be covering the mathematical tools. This is the objective for this lesson. So when we measure data in our labs, we are looking at accuracy and precision. Accuracy is referred to the measuring near the truest value. Some key words you see is correctness, how close it is to expected value, and how on target it is. Sometimes, um, we also talk about precision, which is how consistent those results are. Certain words you see is consistent, exactness, and how closely grouped they are. There are four types. We could say low precision because here it's all scattered and low accuracy. Then there is low accuracy and high precision. It's low accuracy because it is far away from the target in the center, but it has high precision because they're all grouped together. This is high accuracy because it's close to the center, but low position because it's still scattered. Then the best one is high accuracy and high precision because it's the dots are all clustered together and right in the middle. Sometimes you might see this in a graph like this. You see positive correlation in terms of how the data points are all very close together. Negative correlation is when they're all close together and going down, or there is no correlation where everything is scattered and you can't draw a line of best fit. That is a way that you've seen accuracy and precision before. Now we've got to talk about some variables. There are three types. Your independent, your dependent, and your constant value. Your independent variable are things that you plug in, which is your x value that you can control. Your dependent value variable changes depending on the independent variable. That makes sense because dependent means it depends on something. And your constant value never changes. You might see your constant value as your initial condition or the parameters of the question. So in this graph that I give, which is the distance and time graph, you should see the independent variable as time because it is on the x-axis. It is something that you control. It's what you plug in. The result that we get is the distance traveled by the object. And the constant variable here is going to be your starting distance of the car because where the car starts is the initial condition. Sometimes you see that as the y-intercept. Our traditional measuring device here, sometimes you have a ruler and there is something um, problematic with the ruler is that um, there is an accuracy to plus or minus one millimeter because that is as close as they can get in terms of drawing the millimeter apart from each other. And sometimes you have a digital device like your calculator and you could see that some errors can occur when you divide, let's say 2.0 by 3.0. The proper answer would be 0.67 but your calculator gets you the 0 0.666 goes on it goes on forever okay please report only the proper numbers um such as if you did two divide by three you would leave it as just two divide by three rather than just put 0 0.6666 okay it's only in the end that you should round that's a good thing to keep in mind so here's some information in terms of when you record your lab values The most common practice of significant digits to keep is mostly three. So now we're going to talk about significant fi figures. Okay. Remember, since no measuring device is ever perfect, the values used in science are not exact. The numbers of different digits and instruments is capable of measuring significant digits and reflecting the precision of that device. The number of digits in any digital display is the number of significant figures for an analog device, which is like something manual, like a scale, um, like that you can like press on or pull on, shows th the number of significant figures is the number of digits a observer can see on device plus one more digit of estimation. Significant figures also control the precision of the calculation involving the qualities of the measuring in science. Here's some rules. The leading zeros are refer um, to what is in front and you could ignore the leading zeros. They're not significant because you could always move them when you do scientific notation. 
trap zeros are the zeros in the middle between the other numbers on the left and the right and you always count those and the trailing zeros are only at the end you count them only if there is a decimal point in the value so the display here that you have is 0 0.01200300 this has seven significant digits the reason why is because you can basically move this dot left one two and if you count it here one two three four five six seven okay here are some examples this refers to five civilian digits because you could move this one two three and you could write it as that this has four significant digits because again you can you, uh, 10 to the negative 2 here 1 2 you could write this as 1.02 times 10 to the negative 2 here four significant digits because they're just four zero uh, four numbers the zero here is the trapped zero this has three uh, this has four significant digits because you can write this as one two you can write this as uh, one two or oh, three times ten to the two and this has one significant digits because you can write this as one two three four five six seven eight nine you can write this as three times ten to the nine okay what if you want to record the last value and indicate that it has three significant figures? You would have to include a decimal. Once you include the decimal, this has 10 significant digits. But again, you could write this in scientific notation like this. So here's some rules in calculating with significant figures. Please understand that the AP test no longer worries or penalize for significant figures. Our basic Metric conversions, the three most common ones for the AP physics are given here, which is kilometers, centimeters, two meters. Here is the example given. Notice that every one of these are your unit conversions that you should memorize from, that you do not have to memorize because it is on your formula sheet. Some, let's talk about vectors now. First of all, we talk about the magnitude. The magnitude represents um, a quantity. A scalar is refers to the magnitude only. There is no positive or negative associated with it. Sometimes you see it written italics, so it's sideways. Some vectors. A vector has both magnitude and direction. Vector and magnitude can be both positive or zero. And it is written italics with an arrow. So notice that this, you can see velocity written as V arrow, or you could bolt the V and a can be written with the arrow and bolted a that means acceleration so distance would be your scalar um, speed would also be a scalar but if you put v here with the arrow it means velocity a with the arrow means acceleration let's look at some vectors here the length of the vector here is referred to the magnitude and once you add the arrow head here it be gives a direction so in this case it gives that the vector or the ray of a is equal to 10 meters in 37 degrees remember two vectors are equal if they have the same magnitude which is the same length and the same direction same angle they do not have to start at the same location and end at the same location to be equal so in this case this which is 10 is uh, can be the same thing as this even though they start at two different locations let's look at some vector arrows here positive can be one way and the negative would be just in the opposite direction you can apply normal mathematics rule to vector qualities that is not wise let's take a look if you have four going four east and three pace up north you can add these vectors together like so and this would be your result. We know from our Pythagorean theorem that this would be the result. Or you can 
have it as a result this way. This is if you're going to do the tip to tail method because this is where the tip, all right? And this is from the tail method, okay? It goes from the tail to the tip. Or you can use a parallelogram. A parallelogram just refers to a four-sided object here. Here, this is when they start both tail and tail, okay? This is just some fine details for you to figure this one out. But here, you should already see that it doesn't matter which one you set up. You can still use a squared plus b squared equals to c squared because this is the vector a is a, vector b, b and vector c is your c part. Here, you could do the resulting vector. Please understand that in this case, it was a right triangle. So we know that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Solving for the algebra, you can get this. If you would like to get the angle measurement, you would have to do theta is equal to tan inverse of uh, your opposites over your adjacent. Okay. Please understand that your B is your opposite. This is your theta because you see how that's opposite to theta. And this is your adjacent because it is close to that theta. Please notice that when you do this, it's different from just your adding your vectors. Sometimes you might get lucky when they're parallel vectors and you could just add it like this. Remember, this only works when the vectors are parallel. Sometimes you might see when it has a negative value. So in this case, notice that the um, four is in the negative direction. So it is negative four plus three that equals to negative one so here you could say that this still has one meter because that is the magnitude but they put the negative x direction and this just gives the direction to it let's look at our vector component this is our most um, common one and theta is going to be referred to right here the adjacent leg is given here because it's closest this is the opposite because it is the farthest away the longest line is referred to the hypotenuse the vector components can be given as opposite vector to it can be given as your hypotenuse times your sine which is given right here and your adjacent can be as your hypotenuse times cosine Now we could talk about some reference angles. Here I just gave you three common ones, but it depends on where you fall, okay? And this just refers to, you can see it from multiple ways. Lastly, I just wanna make sure that you understand the different relationships that we have and how to linearize them, okay? The first one is your constant. Y remains constant despite the change in the X. You would say this has no relationship. This is linear, requires no change for linearization. Sometimes you might see Y equals to um, CX, or you might also see this as uh, Y is equal to MX. This is called directly proportion. And this is also called linear. This required no, no linearization. If you see it decay like this, you call it y is inversely proportioned to x. This is called a hy hyperbolic. You might see this as y is equal to um, c just refers to like a constant here, okay? Um, you might see it as 1 over x. That's what it means. If it goes directly goes up, that is your squared, which is y is directly proportioned to the squared of x. You, call, you could see this as a quadratic or a parabolic. And lastly, you have your 1 divided by x squared. This is very common in physics. This is called inversely proportioned to the squared of x. And it decays like that. Please be aware of a lot of physics properties that you're going to deal with this year. We'll deal with the last one, inversely proportioned. Okay, so there you go. These are all the mathematical tools that you need for AP Physics.